We're very excited to be in the Oxford University Museum of Natural History today to meet Dr. Frankie Dunn, who has a very interesting study out in the scientific press. And it's got something to do with the ancient geology of Charnwood Forest. So tell us, Frankie, what have you been studying in Charnwood Forest? Well, there are um, fossils within Charnwood Forest that date back to a geological period called the Ediacaran. So the Ediacaran span from about 635 to about 540 million years ago, so a very long time ago. And the fossils um, in Charnwood Forest are about 560 million years old. And this is a really important time because the geological period that follows the Ediacaran, the Cambrian period, is when animals um, start to appear globally and in huge number. And it's been this kind of paleontological mystery. Where do animals come from? And are there any animals amongst the strange fossils of the Ediacaran period? And we find these strange fossils in the Ediacaran rocks of Charnwood Forest. Um, and one fossil that I've been studying is called Charnia, and it's named after Charnwood Forest because that's where it was first uh, described. And it kind of looks like a strange fern frond. I think we're here. We do. We're lucky enough to have a cast. This is a replica that's in the, uh, in the collections here at the museum. Do you want to take us through why is it so strange? So I guess if you... Um, had never looked at a charnia before, you might think that it looks a lot like a plant, like a fern. But actually, we know that it was growing uh, deep on the seafloor, out of the photic zone. So unlike plants, it couldn't photosynthesize. And this led to um, a suite of different hypotheses about what charnia might be. If it's not a plant, is it an animal? Um, is it a fungus? Is it something that's not closely related to animals or fungi, but is totally extinct? <clears throat> and this has been, um, yeah, kind of a mystery for the last 70 years since this discovery. So, as you've been looking at this strange creature that lived in the deep, dark ocean 560 million years ago, what have you been doing? How have you been studying this strange creature, Charnia? Uh, how has that been helping you to work out what this is? So, um, as I've said now, probably exhaustively, Charnia doesn't really look like anything that's alive today. And so people have used anatomical characters. So, um, for example, we have an arm, that would be an anatomical character. They've used um, anatomical characters to try to ally Charnia to living groups, but without huge amounts of success. So I'm particularly interested in growth and development. And we've, we were able to study how Charnia grew, because in Charnwood Forest, there's a whole population of Charnias uh, ranging from about two centimeters to about uh, 45 centimeters on one single fossil bed. And so we were able to count the number of branches. Um, and you might be able to see that there are, there are branches within branches, and we were able to count those as well and compare the number and size of these branches between different specimens of Charnia of different sizes to work out how it was growing over time. So there's a very special place in Charnwood Forest. Unfortunately, it has to be kept secret because it's so important to paleontologists. And at this site, there are these wonderful, wonderful specimens. And you've been measuring them all, putting all of that information together. Now, tell us, what's the big result? Charnia grew um, like animals grow today. And the way Charnia grows, it's not just like animals, but it's not like lots of other things, uh, like fungi, to which Charnia has been previously compared. Um, and we can use this growth data alongside other facets of Charnia's anatomy to work out exactly where in the animal tree of life Charnia sits. Um, and we recover it as most closely related to a group called the Eumetazoans. So that includes jellyfish, um, insects and us. So it's most of the diversity of living animal life. So Frankie's just introduced us there to the club of organisms, specifically animals that are eumetazoa, jellyfish, insects, us, many, many other things. But it's interesting, what are the, just so people at home can understand, what are the animals that are not eumetazoa? Oh, there aren't many. Um, sponges 
are an example of animals which are not hematozoans. And in fact, I think a lot of people don't recognize immediately that sponges are animals, uh, that they are, and a number of people think that they're in fact some of the very oldest animals. So characters which define the group eumetazoans, uh, things which all eumetazoans share, are things like muscles and nervous system. So things that are pretty fundamental to the way uh, we live our lives and insects get around. Uh, sponges have precursors to those characters, but they don't have them. They haven't evolved along um, in evolutionary history at that point. So Frankie and her international team, including colleagues from across the UK and Russia, have shown that Charnia, found and first described from the rocks of Charnwood Forest, is not only an animal, but is a specific type of animal known as a eumetazoan. Now, final question, Frankie, why does this matter? What does this tell us about the world that we live in? What does this tell us about Earth history? What's, what's the, what's, why is it so important that that this Ediacaran organism was a eumetazoan? Well, from a scientific perspective, uh, as I've mentioned ad nauseum, we've not known what Charnia and its relatives are for a really long time. Um, and I hope, if I'm correct, this goes some way to addressing this outstanding paleontological mystery. But um, I guess it's important for us to know for a number of reasons. Firstly, curiosity. I think we all want to know where we came from. And it's really cool and interesting if... Um, the fossils which show us what some of our earliest ancestors would have looked like are just on our doorstep. Um, and secondly, it can tell us about how the characters which we have come to define the eumetazoa evolved through time. So we might expect, for example, that to develop muscles and nervous system, you have to have uh, like a pretty consistent way of growing and developing. That makes intuitive sense, doesn't it? If you're growing in all different ways, uh, like sponges, um, you can't really develop muscles or a, a complex nervous system. And what we see in Charnia for the first time is a constrained pattern of growth. So what I mean by that is you can go out and you can find any Charnia in the world, and there are many different sites where Charnia is found, um, and it will look pretty much the same. So you can see here these branches are pretty consistent in length all the way up. We don't ever find charniers with branches that are way too long or way too short. And the outline of the frond is predictable based on the size of the organism. So it has a constrained pattern of growth, but no evidence for muscles or a nervous system yet. So what that might suggest um, is that a constrained pattern of growth does indeed predate these, these organ-based characters, um, which is so important in the radiation of eumetazoan life, which happened after the appearance of Charnia. Wonderful, wonderful news, and we are so proud that this has come from rocks and specimens from the Charnwood Forest Geopark. If you want to find out more, Frankie, your, you and your team, you've published this in the scientific press. Just remind us, which, what journal is it in? Science Advances, and it's open access. Open access, so anyone can go on to Science Advances and find out this wonderful story. Thank you so much, Frankie. Pleasure.